In this lecture, I will discuss the beginning of the slow decline of Egypt following the era of Ramses II that eventually led to the so-called Late Kingdom. I will talk about Ramses' successor, his son Merneptah, and his victory stele upon which is found the very first non-biblical mention of the Israelites. Then I will talk about the last great pharaoh of the New Kingdom, Ramses III, and his successful defense of Egypt in history's first recorded sea battle, which was fought against the so-called Sea Peoples, who seemed to be intent upon migrating en masse into the delta and taking it by force. I will then take a brief detour north into the Aegean area in order to identify who those mysterious Sea Peoples may have been and what drove them to invade Egypt, and how some of them related to people that may have fought the Trojans in the Trojan War. And then how a militant, biblical era people known as the Philistines fit into this whole picture, in order to suggest an answer to the mystery of who the ancestors of Goliath the Philistine giant were. I will then wrap it up by taking a brief look at the era when the Libyans, of all people, ruled Egypt and introduce you to the most unfortunate Pierre Monte, a French Egyptologist who has undeservedly faded from memory despite having discovered one of the greatest pharaonic treasures in history, second only to that of King Tut. Now, of course, there isn't as much new art and architecture to investigate here, which is the problem with a culture whose art and architecture doesn't change much over the centuries. So I'll spend a little more time with Egypt and its neighbors. So there's a lot to discover here in this mostly ignored era of Egyptian history. So let's get started. So here we are nearly to the late kingdom era. We can see the beginnings of Egypt's long decline in the events that follow the death of Ramses II. I will begin with the successor of Ramses, Merneptah, his thirteenth son. Now, given the very long life of Ramses II, Merneptah was already in his seventies when he became pharaoh. So he was probably fortunate to live long enough to rule for another ten years. However, in the fifth year of his reign, when he was seventy-five years old, foreigners once again invaded Egypt. So a major invasion of Egypt once more. Now this time, the invasion came from the west. These were the North African people known as the Libyans. So this is the Libyan campaign in the fifth year of Merneptah's reign. Now Merneptah was able to defeat them and take many prisoners, as you can see in this relief that is inscribed on the walls of the temple of Medinet Habu, which is located near Thebes. In this relief, you can see Merneptah in the traditional striking pose with one hand raised holding a battle mace, while the other hand grips the top knots of a bunch of Libyan prisoners who raise their hands in supplication. Here's another relief that still retains some of its paint that shows us how the Egyptians restrained their prisoners of war. You can tell they are foreigners by their clothing, their beards, and their hairstyles. But the thing that I want you to notice is that their arms are bound at the elbows either behind their backs, or in front of their torsos, or over their heads. This is another interesting relief. The Egyptians, as we know, were great record keepers. And one of the things that they liked to keep a record of was the number of enemy dead on the battlefield. Now you no doubt remember this relief from the Palette of Narmer, in which the king is touring the battlefield to view the dead. Each body with its head between its legs representing, it is believed, a, a thousand dead. Well, later on, the traditional way of counting the dead on the battlefield was to cut off the right hands of each dead soldier, collect them all, and then count them. So here you see an Egyptian official counting the hands in this pile while his scribe records the count on his tally board. Well, while this would seem to be a very good way of doing it, there was too much opportunity, apparently, for cheating, since a glory-seeking general might have his men cut off a few Egyptian hands as well to inflate the total. And who would know? 
Well, Merneptah devised a clever way to prevent that sort of thing. He instructed his officials to collect something much more uniquely personal. Now this works because about the only people in the ancient world that practiced circumcision were the Hebrews and the Egyptians. So therefore it was easy for Merneptah's officials to get an accurate count of the Libyan dead by counting their penises because only the uncircumcised ones would be counted, so no chance for cheating. So here we see a pile of uncircumcised penises being counted by Merneptah's official, while his scribe records the count. Now this gives us a much more accurate way of counting the dead, which in this particular case was 6,359. <laughs> Now, one of the things that Merneptah had to do during his reign was to also put down an uprising of a few Canaanite cities. Now, this was recorded on the so-called Victory Stele of Merneptah, which was erected in about 1208 BC. Now, this was created in order to brag about the Pharaoh's victories over his foreign enemies. And we see him doing that here in this top panel, dedicating his victories to the gods in a formulaic representation. Now, nothing special here. What is most interesting to historians is found in the last few lines of the stele. So here you get a good idea of the size of this stele, which is a good sized slab of stone. So the hieroglyphs on the stele describe Merneptah's victorious campaigns then list the cities of Canaan that he punished. Now, line 27, you can see in this area that has been darkened by the rubbings of people that are taking souvenirs, is important because it is the first reference, the first non-biblical reference, to Israel as a people. It says, Israel is no more. Its seed is destroyed bit of hyperbole, of course, but that's typical of the time, right? The thing that's significant here is that it not only verifies the existence of Israel in Canaan by 1208 BC, thereby helping to establish a time frame for the Exodus, assuming the Exodus ever happened, but the hieroglyphs that are used here refer to Israel as an identifiable group of people in Canaan, not as a city like the other references on the stele. Well, this helps to lay to rest the question of whether Israel was a real entity in Canaan, a fact that some secular historians, quite frankly, have questioned. Now, the sarcophagus of Merneptah is worth taking a look at because it's a beautiful design in granite that we have not seen before, with a pharaoh reclining in the royal death pose on the lid. And here we see the old gentleman himself. Now, with Merneptah's son, Sipta, we see what might be interpreted as the first evidences of a new decline in Egyptian society or government, in that we see a pharaoh that has a deformed foot, as you can see here. As we've talked about before, in the ancient world, the expectation was that kings must be physically whole or perfect. If this pharaoh is demonstrably physically handicapped, does that suggest a weakening of the royal office? Now, I know that some of you don't like it when I suggest that the presence of a woman in supreme power is an indication of decline. But one has to assume that, given the tradition of male domination in leadership roles in Egypt, when a woman steps into that role, it may be because traditions are weakening. And that's what happens after Sipta's death. Twoseret, his stepmother, takes control of the Egyptian government and rules for two years. Now, with her passing, the 19th dynasty comes to an end. Again, perhaps an indication of weakening within the halls of power, when no viable heir to the throne can be found. In any case, a new dynasty begins, the 20th, with the ascension to the throne of a man by the name of Seknot an indication of the repulsion that still exists over the idea of a female at the top of the social pyramid is that one of the first things that Setnacht does is to erase all references to Twasaret. Now, Seknacht is the father of Ramses III, 
Ramses III is the last great pharaoh of the new kingdom. Now, Ramses will have a somewhat unfortunate career. He does rule for a lengthy 32 years. But in his fifth year, he must face another major invasion of Egypt by the Libyans, just like Merneptah had to do. He was able to drive them off successfully, just in time to face the invasion of the so-called Sea Peoples. So let's pause here for a moment and just see who these so-called Sea Peoples were. Here we see a map of the Eastern Mediterranean, which is the setting for what some historians have called the calamitous 13th century. And this is the home ground of the Sea Peoples. But before we take a look at them, first a little background. Some of you are familiar with the Minoans, an advanced culture that ruled the island of Crete. They were the dominant power in the Aegean from about 2000 BC until about the mid-1400s. Then their contemporaries, the Mycenaeans, a militant people who ruled the Peloponnesus, which is here in the area of Greece, invaded the island and conquered the Minoans. They destroyed all the Minoan palaces, except for the greatest palace, which was called Knossos, and they occupied that for the next 200 years or so. They were now the main power in the Aegean, and would remain at the height of their power until about 1250 BC. I'll tell you what happened to them in just a minute, but first, just who were they? Well, the Mycenaeans were a warrior society, with the soils of their native Peloponnesus being fairly poor and rocky, they made their living mainly by hiring themselves out as mercenaries to the highest bidder. And apparently because of their military prowess, their services were in pretty high demand. What you see here is a golden death mask of one of their greatest kings and a bronze sword, both of which have been recovered from one of their royal tombs. The point here, though, is that these people had a reputation as fearsome warriors. Now, to clear up a little popular misunderstanding, remember how I debunked the misconception that pyramids had been built by Hebrew slaves? Well, here is another popular misconception. Now, hopefully you have heard of the famous Greek poet Homer. He's famous for his two great epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Now, the Iliad is the story of a ten-year war between the Greeks and the Trojans fighting over the possession of a woman who was described as the most beautiful woman in the world, a face that launched a thousand ships. Well, here is our map, and here is Troy, located on the western coast of modern-day Turkey. Now, according to Homer, the Trojan prince Paris, on a diplomatic trip to Sparta, a Mycenaean city in the Peloponnesus, fell in love with and kidnapped the beautiful Queen Helen the wife of the king of Sparta, a man by the name of Menelaus. Then Paris sailed away with his beautiful trophy back to Troy. Meanwhile, Menelaus appealed to the greatest king of the Mycenaeans, his brother Agamemnon. He appealed for his help in getting his wife back. Now, Agamemnon could not let this insult pass, so he rallied his troops and his allies the most prominent of whom was the unsurpassed warrior Achilles. And they put a fleet together and sailed off to Turkey to bring Helen back. They besieged the city of Troy for the next ten years. And the Iliad is the story of the last year of that conflict, which results in the destruction of Troy and the deaths of the great heroes Achilles, Hector, and Paris, and others, and the retrieval of Helen. So here we see from the cast of the recent movie Troy the main Greek principles. Menelaus, Helen, Agamemnon, Achilles, and Odysseus, and the Trojan heroes Hector and his brother Paris. Now I think the casting director did a pretty good job in selecting his cast, although I did have my doubts initially about Brad Pitt as Achilles. 
but actually I think he did a pretty good job. Now, the movie itself is pretty much Hollywood nonsense, but I think it is worth seeing. The only actor that I think was poorly cast was Orlando Bloom as Paris. He just doesn't seem like a heroic type to me. Anyway, my point here is that these were not Greeks, despite popular opinion to the contrary. Homer never calls them Greeks. He calls them Achaeans. In fact, his epithet for them is the long-haired Achaeans. By the way, his epithet for the Trojans was tamers of horses because they were famous for breeding horses. So, who were the Achaeans? Well, the Achaeans were Homer's name for the Mycenaeans, not the Greeks. The Greeks weren't even around yet. And so, these Mycenaeans were militant rulers of the Peloponnesus, and they form the primary actors within the epic poem of the Iliad. Okay, so, back to the Sea Peoples. Mycenaean power was at its height about 1250 B.C., and then everything collapsed. Now, what caused the collapse was a devastating drought that struck the eastern Mediterranean in the mid-13th century, as shown by recent studies of the seabed. Now, this drought caused the economies around the eastern Mediterranean to fail, not just the Mycenaeans, but other economies as well, especially the fragile warrior-based economies like the Mycenaeans. Widespread insurrection spread throughout the Peloponnesus, and city-states warred over drastically diminished resources as wells dried up and crops died. Then, very similar to the event that we saw bring down the old kingdom in Egypt, civil authority collapsed, cities were destroyed, and the surviving populations fled their homelands seeking refuge. Now, these populations included people called the Shekelesh. These were located in Sicily, more than likely. Now, these are the names that the Egyptians give to them. So, the Shekelesh from Sicily. The Denian from the northern Greek area. The Peleset from the Peloponnesus. Peleset is the Egyptian word for the Mycenaeans. The Checker, probably the Trojans. The Sherdan the Laka, the Teresh, the Ekwesh, and finally the Weshesh. A bunch of strange names for us, but nevertheless, this is the way these peoples are identified in the Egyptian records. Now, due to the chaos and famine, mass migrations of these people took place as they sought places of refuge. And the most obvious place of refuge was Egypt because it was mostly unaffected by the drought, since its water was provided by the Nile, which wasn't affected by the drought, since the drought didn't reach into Central Africa, which was the source of the Nile River. So, the Mycenaean refugees, the Peleset, joined a coalition of the so-called Sea Peoples and converged on Egypt by land and by sea. So, here we see a drawing of an Egyptian relief that shows part of this migration. In other words, what we're seeing here are Egyptian warriors fighting foreigners, and those foreigners are identified by their feathered headdresses. Now, this is a migration here, not an invasion by chariots, because this is, these are not chariots. These are heavy carts pulled by oxen and filled with families and goods, as these people track over land and try to find a place of refuge. Now, unfortunately, these are a militant sort of people, and so as they move over land, they are bringing with them fire and destruction all along the way. Now, Ramses did not want to be inundated by this horde of starving and warlike peoples, so he repulsed the invasion in history's first recorded sea battle and on land, like we see here in this relief. So, here's a reproduction of a temple relief in which we see a disorganized scene that's indicative of the chaos of battle as Egyptian and Sea People's ships 
intermingle in combat. Now the forces of Ramses III were able to achieve a great victory, and the invasion was driven off. Now it might seem a little strange that the Egyptians were able to be victorious in a sea battle, since as we've talked about before, they were not great seafarers. And the sea peoples were, obviously. So how did Ramses manage to win the sea battle? Well, according to the accounts, the suggestion is that the Egyptian admiral was able to lure the sea peoples into the streams and canals of the delta where they could not maneuver very effectively and basically turned the sea battle into a land battle. In any case, they were able to be successful and drive off the sea peoples. Now, as a consequence of this victory, Ramses' forces took many prisoners of war, as you can see here in this relief. That's similar to the one that we saw from Merneptah. Again, you see the arms bound at the elbows, and you can identify them as foreigners because of the feathered headdresses or helmets. So this is the type of headgear that was often used by the Egyptians to designate the Peleset, or the Mycenaeans. Now, after the battle was over, Ramses wisely decided to form an alliance with the Peleset, rather than simply driving them off. Now, he knew their reputation as great warriors. Perhaps he had even employed them from time to time as mercenaries in an earlier time. And so he permitted them to settle along the coast in southern Canaan. So here, in this part of the Levant. Now he did this because as a kind of a military society, he knew that they would form a nice buffer between Egypt and any further invasions from the north. So these are the people that eventually became known as the Philistines, a warlike people that became some of the greatest enemies of Israel. You see here a map of the territory of the kingdom of Israel to the north and the kingdom of Judah to the south, and then the Philistines settled along the coastal plains. So this solves a long-standing biblical question of where the Philistines came from. Because in the Old Testament story of kings, the Philistines simply show up all of a sudden to harass David and Saul and to be a thorn in the side of Israel. But there's no explanation really of where they came from. And so, biblical scholars have long pondered the question of where did these Philistines come from? And now we have the answer. They came from the Peloponnesus. Now, if you aren't familiar with the Philistines, you've probably heard of Goliath, right? The great Philistine that David fought and killed as a boy? Now, undoubtedly, you have seen these famous statues of David by Donatello and Bernini, right? Well, it's that Goliath. Now, as proof that the Philistines were Mycenaeans, there are some material cultural proofs, such as these artifacts. Now, on this side, we see Mycenaean, and on this side are the Philistines. So, here, a clay figurine of a seated female. A very abstract figure, rather plank-like in design and seated on a stool. Well, here we see a Philistine version of that female. This is called an Ashdoda figurine. Strange looking, of course, but undeniably similar. And then here are some ceramics. Now, ceramics are some of the most reliable evidences for archaeologists because fired ceramics, as we've talked about before, are very long-lasting and can be dated and the design of everyday household objects like pots and bowls and storage vessels are very resistant to change within a culture. So here we see what is called a stirrup handled jar from Mycenae. And here is one from a Philistine city, and you can see an obvious similarity. Now these ceramic vessels in Philistia began as wares that had been brought by settlers from Mycenae. Now we know that because the type of clay from which those early vessels were made comes from the Peloponnesus. But then as the years passed, the same vessels continued to appear, but were produced from local clays. That would indicate that the women who were using them 
were now Philistines using the traditional pottery designs from their ancestral homelands of the Peloponnesus. Now, if that's not proof enough, DNA studies in 2019 of burials at the Philistine city of Ashkelon show that their ancestors had come from the area of Greece or Cyprus. And they differed in DNA from the native peoples of Canaan. So, begs the question, was Goliath a Mycenaean? Well, in addition to those physical and DNA proofs, here's a very interesting literary indication of this fact, in which we see two descriptions of a warrior arming for battle. First, a warrior from the Iliad, as described by Homer. So, he says, He tied round his legs a pair of splendid greaves. Next, he put on plated armor on his breast. Over his shoulder he slung a bronze sword and a great shield. On his head he set a well-made helmet. Last, he took up a powerful spear, fitted to his grip. Now here is the description of a Philistine, in this case Goliath, arming for battle as described in the Old Testament. And Goliath had a helmet of bronze upon his head, and he was clad with plates of armor. And he had greaves of bronze upon his legs, and a javelin was slung over his shoulder. And the staff of his spear was as big as a beam, and his servant went before him, bearing his shield. So here we have clear indications that the Philistines were the descendants of the Mycenaeans or Peleset, the warriors that had battled Ramses III in the Delta. Now, back to Ramses III. One of the interesting features of his reign was a so-called harem conspiracy. In his 32nd year, after he had successfully dealt with two major invasions, he celebrated the Heb Sed festival at Thebes. Now, following that celebration, disaster struck. Now, as you know, pharaohs usually had several wives and a large harem of concubines. Well, so did Ramses III. But some court records that were kept by the Egyptians have come down to us that report that one of his queens, a woman by the name of Tia, conspired with 38 of the harem women to have him murdered. Now this was so her own son could become pharaoh instead of the official heir who was still very young. Now they were able to carry out their plan and forensic studies show that Ramsey's throat was cut to the bone. And here we see his mummy and notice a scarf that was wrapped around his neck by priests to hide that ghastly wound. Now just an interesting side note. Many of you are probably familiar with a series of mummy movies that were released not too long ago. Those were based on the original mummy movie, which was produced in 1932, starring Boris Karloff. So here we see an image of Boris Karloff as the mummy. Now, it's interesting to note that his makeup and costume was actually based on Ramses III. So kind of a little interesting factoid. And then here we see the beautiful granite sarcophagus of Ramses. Anyway, the records show that the harem women were arrested and put on trial for the murder of the pharaoh. But also those records indicate that some of the harem women actually tried to seduce the trial judges in order to be found not guilty. Most of them were executed anyway. Now, no one knows what happened to Queen Tia and her son, but their tombs were later desecrated and their names were erased. And then the official heir goes on to become Pharaoh anyway and takes the name of Ramses IV. Now, from this point onward, the empire seems to decline fairly rapidly. So we're not going to go over all of that, but here is a summary of the pharaohs of the 20th dynasty. So, of course, there was Ramses III, then his son, Ramses IV, then someone by the name of Montuher Kepeshev, quite a mouthful, I would say, 
Then Ramses the Ninth. Now, don't ask me what happened to Ramses the Fifth, Sixth, Seventh, and Eighth, <laughs> because I don't know. But anyway, under Ramses the Ninth, we get some desperate times. It is during his reign that most of the tombs in the Valley of the Kings were robbed. This may have been with a collusion of the Pharaonic office itself, since they were in a time of severe economic decline, and money was needed. And I can imagine the Pharaoh might be looking at all that gold secreted away in the tombs and thinking, ah, I can probably put that to better use, and so promotes the robbing of the tombs. Now, this view is supported by the fact that some tombs of later eras were found to contain reused funerary items from these New Kingdom tombs, which meant that they had been passed on at the pharaonic level and then reused later on. So, again, another sign of weakening centralized control. So then there was Ramses X. Now, he's the last king of the dynasty. The tomb robbing goes on unabated during his reign. So this is why most of the New Kingdom tombs were empty when opened in the modern era. And we already have learned why all of the pre-dynastic and Old Kingdom tombs were empty. All of these being looted during periods of trouble. Now, in addition, the weakness of the government was apparent in the fact that most foreign territories under Ramses X were lost. Places such as Philistia, Israel, and all of the northern territories. While in the south, Nubia revolted and broke away also. Now this is serious because Nubia had long been a source of Egypt's gold. So this all is indicative of the fact that Egypt was in serious trouble once again. So following the reign of Ramses II, a new dynasty was founded the 21st dynasty. But it was still very weak. In fact, weak enough that a pharaoh by the name of Ramses XI ruled from the delta, while in the south, a priest of Amun by the name of Harry Hor made himself king of the south and ruled from Thebes. So, Egypt is divided into two kingdoms once again. Now, as of during the reign of Ramses XI, that the priests decided to rescue as many mummies as they could find and save them from damage and from looting by hiding them in the so-called royal cache at Deir el-Bari that I have talked about before. This is the cave where the mummy of Ramses II and of Hatshepsut and others were found. So it is under these failing conditions that the Libyans, of all people, came riding to the rescue establishing the 22nd dynasty, the Libyan dynasty, under the rule of a man by the name of Shashank I. Now, Shashank was chief of the Meshwesh, which, if you will remember, was the name of one of the tribes of the Sea Peoples from the west desert of Libya. Now, Shashank was a general of the Egyptian army, interestingly enough, having risen through the ranks of the military from among a community of Libyans who had been allowed to settle peacefully in the Delta. So this was not the result of another invasion. Of course, he was a commoner, but he saw that Egypt was in trouble. So he seized power and proclaimed himself Pharaoh under the name of Shishank I. He did legitimize his reign, though, by marrying into the royal family of Ramses XI. Now, he was able to impose his authority and was able to reunite Egypt by bringing Harry Hor to heel, and he was able to bring stability to the kingdom for a while. Now, he built a capital city in the delta that he called Bubastis, and he ruled from there. Now, it is with Shashank that we have another interesting intersection with the Old Testament stories. Now, this all happened during the time of King Solomon in Israel. And after the death of Solomon, Shashank mounted a military campaign into Canaan in order to bring those cities that had rebelled and broken away back into the fold. He wanted to bring them back under Egyptian control so he could receive tribute from them once again and replenish Egyptian coffers. 
So we have this inscription on the wall of one of his temples in which he lists all of the cities that he recaptured. 156 of them, according to this account. Probably an exaggeration. Now we see them indicated here by name rings that identify which cities they were. Ironically enough, though, Jerusalem is not listed among them. Now, as indicated by the Old Testament writings, Shashank was apparently bought off from capturing Jerusalem by being bribed with the golden treasures from the palace and temple of King Solomon. So this is what the scriptures say. And it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shashak, which was the Hebrew name for Shashank, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem with 1,200 chariots and 36,000 horsemen and people without number. And he took the walled cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. So a hundred and those 156 cities. And then he arrives before the walls of Jerusalem. And he took away the treasures of the temple and the treasures of the palace. He took it all. So even though it doesn't say so, Jerusalem probably avoided capture in this case by becoming a vassal to Egypt and promising to pay fairly significant annual tribute. Now here we see a cutaway view of the Temple of Solomon and are reminded of the fact that the temple contained much gold in terms of coverings on the walls and the floors and the many of the implements within the temple itself. In any case, Shashank then returns to Egypt loaded with his treasures and built the largest and last pylon at Karnak. So this is the gate of the pylon temple at Karnak that we have seen a number of times this term. One interesting feature of this gate is that on the inside you can see the remains of an actual mud brick ramp which had been used to build the pylon gate but for whatever reason was never dismantled and remains there to this day. You can see that it's composed of several sun-dried mud brick buttresses that were then infilled with dirt and rubble. Anyway, now to finish off our look at this era. We go to the capital city of Tanis in the Delta, the capital having been moved there from Bubastis. The name of that city may be familiar to you because of the first Indiana Jones movie in which he was searching for the lost Ark of the Covenant. So here we see where Indy has learned that the secret of the Ark's location can be found in the Well of Souls at a temple in Tanis. The light from the opening shines through a crystal on his staff to pinpoint the location of the Ark. Well, in reality, the city of Tanis really did contain hidden treasure. And this is where the story of the unfortunate Pierre Monte finishes up our survey of this era. The French archaeologist Pierre Monte has to be among the most unlucky archaeologists ever. His is the perfect story of being in the right place at the wrong time. Now he was excavating at Tanis and began digging with his team at the temple there. Beneath the flagstones of the temple courtyard, he found a passageway that led to a tomb that had, unfortunately, already been looted long before. However, he didn't give up, and continued searches revealed a hidden passage at the back of the tomb. When his men broke into this passage, it led to a second tomb, which, much to his delight, had not been looted. Its treasures were still intact. Foremost among those treasures was a coffin of solid silver. So here we see the coffin of Shishank II. Now it's interesting to note that silver may have been even more precious to Egyptians than gold. And here we see an entire coffin made of solid silver. And you can see how beautiful this mummiform coffin was. The head of it fashioned in the shape of Horus the hawk. And inside was his body covered by this beautiful solid gold mask. But that's not all. To everyone's surprise, there was a large granite plug blocking a passage in the back of the tomb. It was so large it took Monte's men five days 
just to chip it away. And when they did, they found beyond it two more intact tombs. Well, what a fabulous find. Most important among the burial equipment in these tombs were a gold coffin in one and a silver coffin in the other. Now you can see these magnificent objects here, beautifully crafted. Now it turned out that these three tombs contained some of the most remarkable finds ever made in Egypt, nearly rivaling that of King Tut. But hardly anyone noticed. And why was that? Because, as I say, the right place at the wrong time. Because this discovery just happened to occur right before World War II was starting in Europe. And the world's attention was not focused on archaeological finds in Egypt right then. So my next lecture will deal with the late kingdom and the rocky road that Egypt will have to navigate in an increasingly dangerous world of powerful empires that rose up to compete in swallowing up the entire Middle East. And it will be forced to face its own diminishing role in that world. So, I'll see you then.